My friend offered to buy my house for $1. I-31F grew up pretty poor. I don't remember it well, but at one point my parents and I were only able to afford to eat beans and rice. My parents have since been able to pull out of poverty, and while they aren't rich, they are comfortable. And I have used a lot of what I experienced as a kid as motivation to be super careful with my money. I got a job in high school, worked odd jobs on the side, saved up every penny, rode my bike everywhere instead of driving and paying for gas, and by the time I moved out of my parents' place, I had a little over 17k in my savings. I don't have that much tucked away anymore, but I have investments and emergency funds, and take my family's finances incredibly seriously, as I never want my children to experience what I did as a kid. Mine and my husband's financial choices afforded us the opportunity to purchase a home in the beginning of 2015, which we bought 50-50 with his mother. He paid his half up front, I made a large down payment, and his mother covered the rest with an escrow agreement that I would pay off what she had purchased. I have since completely paid my half, and the house is fully owned by myself and my husband. It's a four bedroom, one and a one two bath, two story home with a finished basement, attached two car garage on a double lot. We got the house for an absolute steal at only 118K for sale by owners. Since purchasing, we have installed a fence, updated the oven, washer and dryer, water heater, furnace, and paid for materials to have all the interior rooms repainted. The only updates it needs are purely cosmetic, as the exterior paint is an ugly brown pink color which we have started repainting and need to finish. The hardwood floors have some distortion due to it being a 100 plus year old house and us having dogs when we lived there and the bathroom could use an update but structurally speaking doesn't need one. Needless to say, on a scale of one, five with one being tear down the house and start over and five being it's ready to put on the market to sell for 300K today. The house is sitting at a 3.5, four, I have a friend, let's call her Carly, F27, who had incredibly similar experiences to me growing up, but struggles with finances and has never seemed to get the hang of keeping any sort of savings over $1.50 at a time. I'm not sure if it's a lack of self-control or that she's simply too focused in the moment when she gets paid and doesn't think to look in the long term, but she consistently makes her lack of funds everyone else's problem. I don't blame her for having issues with money as learning to create a budget isn't exactly taught in school and it took me years to learn to find a healthy balance and the freedom of being able to buy whatever you want with no restrictions is super tempting. But at some point, you have to learn to take responsibility. During the course of our friendship, I have helped her build countless budgets based off of my own. I made roughly the same amount of money as her, but each time they failed for whatever reason. We tried different ways to try to trick her brain into realizing that money sitting in her account wasn't to be touched as everything needed to be used for bills, etc. And each time she would wind up still using every penny. It finally came to the point where I refused to help her with her budget anymore because she never listens to my advice. And when I pointed out the easiest and fastest method to get her spending under control was to get a payee, she said she didn't need to be treated like a child who receives an allowance. Fair enough. I washed my hands of that topic. Carly moved out of her mom's house a little over six years ago and into a mutual friend's place, let's call her Tia, F27. As far as I have been told by Tia, Carly paid little to nothing in rent, even though they both worked at the same company and made close to the same salary. Carly's living space was an absolute disaster. She moved into the basement and it was lucky if there was even a walkway to get to the washer and dryer. She constantly asked me to come over to help her clean and organize her space. And because I'm a people pleaser, I would always agree. Each time we would make significant progress. But then by the next weekend, when I would come over to help again, it was as if a tornado had gone through her space in the course of the week. I have no idea how she was able to fit so much stuff into that tiny space. She would never clean up on her own or make any sort of effort to put anything away and would always wait for me to come over. And if anyone were to come down to watch us, it was always me cleaning or organizing while she sat back and dictated where everything went. Getting her to donate or throw anything away was like pulling teeth as somehow even the smallest scrap of paper had some sort of sentimental value. After a little over a year of them living together, Tia couldn't handle it anymore and asked Carly to find some other living situation. She wasn't going to throw her onto the street, but she literally couldn't live with Carly any longer. 
There are a lot of other things that built up that caused this, but I won't go into that here. It just so happened that my husband and I had purchased a second home around this same time. What we had owed on the first was paid off, my husband had come into an inheritance, and we were able to look for our forever home that better fit our wants and needs. The best part for us is that the new house was literally a five minute drive from the old house. We had yet to decide whether we wanted to sell or rent our first house when Carly approached us with the offer of renting it from us. She and two other friends were looking to move in together, and with the house being as big as it was, there was plenty of space for all of them to have their own room and privacy. Since we hadn't yet decided if we wanted to sell, and there were three renters already lined up, we decided to use it as a means of passive income to invest in our future. And then down the road we would revisit whether or not we wanted to sell it, or keep it as a rental. The red flag that I didn't initially pick up on was that Carly was already referring to the house as her house to her two potential roommates, even before moving in or signing a lease. So by the time it came to them all moving in, Carly had driven the other two girls to back out. The way I had written the original lease agreement was that the rent was flexible, depending on how many tenants there were. So for the three of them, they would have only been paying $750 total per month, and if only one person was renting, it would be $400 per month. In this area, you can expect to rent a bedroom for $400. So this was a crazy good deal, as we really didn't need the money, and it was mainly to pay for insurance, power heat, and property taxes. In the four years that Carly has lived in that house, rent has gone up four times, once to $500 a month because the power bill went up and we needed to adjust for that, the second time to $550 a month due to the same reason, the third time to $750 after she got a new job, and last year in October, more on that later. Also in the four years she has lived here, two separate opportunities for roommates have backed out, each time because she was setting the rules and referring to the property as her house, despite having zero claim to it, and the fact that each person would have their own lease agreement. When she first moved in, she was working a minimum wage paying job, and she was my friend, hence the low monthly rent, but a year and a half ago, got a new job at a local university, 30 minute drive away, that pays very well and has great benefits, but somehow, she manages to blow through her entire paycheck on, I don't even know what, also, during the course of these past four years, she wound up owing me $750 in back rent, as she repeatedly was unable to pay me the full monthly amount due to repeated miscalculations in her budget and overspending on garbage, which she then stuffed into mine and my husband's property. My husband and I realized after a couple years of being landlords that we aren't cut out for it. We have too much on our own plates and had no time for upkeep and Carly wasn't holding up her end of the rental agreement that she had signed. We talked about it and settled on the decision to sell, but we of course didn't want to throw Carly onto the street and informed her of our plan. She proposed to buy it from us and started going through the route of getting a loan. During this process, she realized that the house wasn't what she wanted. She wanted land, and the house itself was far too big for her. She told us that, and we understood and I even helped drive her to meet with realtors so she could check out other options to buy houses elsewhere, but each one fell through as she discovered that she wasn't going to get a new homeowner's discount or bargain with any loans that she looked at, and all of the loans required at minimum of a 10% down payment, which she of course didn't have. This is where the entitlement starts. Carly wasn't going to be able to buy a home, at least not the home she wanted, and settled on buy our house. We had briefly talked at the very beginning of her tenancy that we may consider a rent to own situation, but no agreement had been made, no sale price had been decided, no appraisals or property inspections completed, nothing had been signed. It was simply a comment that we had made in passing and then chatted about later, again in passing. She took it as gospel truth and said that if she bought the house that she expected the 2.5 years of rent, she had paid us to be comped off the total sale of the house. I reminded her that we never signed anything about a rent to own, and informed her that wasn't how this was going to work. Her next tactic was to try to suggest that we quit claim deed the property to her, again without her paying us anything additional to the two. Five years worth of rent she had already paid us. How this works is that whoever owns the property grants the title deed to whoever they're giving it to, and it's generally a lot faster and cheaper than going through the process of buying a house. 
but there is still generally something paid for the property when the title is transferred. At this point, she'd only paid about $10K in rent, more than half of which went to paying for utilities that we covered instead of having her pay them and property taxes, and she was making it sound as if she wasn't going to give us anything beyond that. I again told her that this would not be a viable option. The house was in great condition, and even with the exterior paint and repairs to the floors and bathroom, was worth at least what we had paid for it, $118K. She tried to spin it that she was doing us a favor by taking it off our hands, as I had expressed to her that we were tired of being landlords and it was more effort than we had time for. Her last attempt at buying the house on her own was to offer me dollar one. That's right, a single dollar. I will admit, I don't know if this was a failed joke attempt on her part, but it certainly fell flat and I was so mad I was shaking, though I laughed it off. Side note, during the time she has lived in the house, my husband and I have some stuff stored in the garage, as Carly parked on the street due to convenience, and she suggested on multiple occasions that she start charging us rent for storing things in our own house when none of it was in her way whatsoever. And we had already made it clear that if she purchased the house, that we would remove all of our property. At the end of 2022, Carly started dating Reggie, 28M. They were long distance and would take turns visiting each other. And Carly made the comment to Reggie that we were looking to sell the house, and we threw out a couple numbers, the very lowest being $100K, but said that we of course would have to have an appraisal and look at market value, etc. He offered to buy it from us and said that he would start the process in March, April of 2023. I was relieved, my husband was relieved, Carly was relieved, everything was looking great. Some information about Reggie at the time, he is a retired Marine. He gets a monthly check from the government for close to $2,000 on top of his well-paying job. I'm guessing based on what Carly told me, but at the time he made his offer, he was probably making between $4,500, $5,000 a month. When March, April came around, Carly and Reggie informed us that he would not be able to afford paying both his rent where he lived and a monthly mortgage payment and wouldn't be able to start the purchase process then, but would start the purchase process in October instead when he planned to move in with Carly. Before Reggie moved in, an ex-friend offered to rent a room in the house from Carly and pay her despite subletting being clearly stated in the lease agreement as prohibited. Carly so generously offered to pay us some of the amount that she was paid. The agreement fell through and the friend did not stay in the room. I'm not exactly sure why he chose to do things the way he did, but Reggie didn't start the purchase process at all until after he had moved and quit his job, meaning the only source of income he had to show to a mortgage company was the monthly stipend from the government, which even with a veteran's loan doesn't work as proof of income. When he moved in, rent increased to $1,000 a month, which is still under value for the size of the home, and a brand new rental agreement was written and signed, stating that if they had not started the buying process to purchase the house from us by mid-April of 2024, that we would not be renewing the lease, nor would we work with them on month-to-month -month rental options, as myself and my husband are completely and totally over this mess. We also stated in the rental agreement that we were not going to list the house for sale as a sign of good faith to allow Reggie and Carly first choice on the house to buy it. Here's a rapid fire list of things that have happened since October. Reggie paid the $750 that Carly owed to me in back rent. Carly and Reggie informed us at some point, either late November or early December, that they would not be buying the house as the repairs required amounted to more than 50K. I don't know where they got this number, as I have budgeted on multiple occasions to redo the flooring, and it would be less than 15K to redo the entire house, nor would repainting cost more than a few thousand, or the bathroom remodel, as they intended to do the work themselves. We repaired the major damage in the bathroom recently for less than $500. They could not acquire rental housing due to having three cats, and will indeed be staying in the house. We informed them we are not renewing the lease and reiterated our reasoning. I made the mistake of telling Carly what we owed on our mortgage, and they turned around and offered us $50K to buy the house from us, less than one three the market value of the house if we sold it as is. We politely declined and then promptly went home and screamed into pillows. They have repeatedly told Tia that they are desperate for money to the point of debating setting up a GoFundMe. All the while Carly has gotten two brand new tattoos in the past year and has an international trip she has paid for in full that she is going on at the end of March, and Reggie has still not acquired even a part-time job. 
We emergency installed a water heater that Reggie paid for that I will have fully paid back by the end of March. Carly quit her job, and now the only income they will have after the end of this week is Reggie's military stipend. Carly nonchalantly stated that we would have to renegotiate rent for this month and next month. There will be no negotiations. She made a bad decision and will have to live with the consequences of her actions. The most recent thing she did was text me two days ago asking if she could pay me in food for this month's rent. Knowing her, the amount she will pay will amount to only a couple meals and maybe $1.75 in groceries instead of the roughly $1.500 that they will owe. I owe Reggie roughly $1.500 left to pay off the last bit of the water heater. I jokingly answered that the electricity and insurance companies don't accept food as payment, so neither can I. She then offered to pay me what it would cost to pay these expenses, and then the rest she would pay in food. I have not responded. It's been a day and a half. They will pay me in cash and nothing else. I'm done. No discussion. My warning to all of you, don't mix business and friends without getting to know said friends very well first. If I had known what I would be walking into, I never would have allowed her to move it. Update one good, fucking God. Thanks for all the comments. There was some great advice in there and I appreciate it, I should clarify. The reason we let Carly move in in the first place is because she made it sound like she literally had nowhere to go. She'd spun a tale that her home life with her mom was not safe, untrue. She made it sound like Tia was literally kicking her out that day, also untrue. And she panically hounded me relentlessly in person and over the phone until my husband and I made a super quick decision to let her rent from us. I've learned this is a method of manipulation. I've reached out to an attorney. We talked about everything that's happened, they read through the lease, and gave us a few options. We wait until May 1st, when Carly and Reggie are supposed to be out of the house. If they're not out, deliver a intent to sell notice. That gives them 90 days to vacate the property after the lease is up. Not ideal. We deliver the intent to sell now. That means they have until mid-June to GTFO. Still not ideal but better. If they're still in the house past the 90 days, we file unlawful detainer and the cops forcibly kick them out. We can't evict because we don't have the grounds, even with all of this. The courts just about everywhere are against landlords and in favor of tenants. That the minute their rent is late, we then have grounds for eviction. That gives them 14 days to pay or GTFO. But if they pay, the eviction process ends. So still not ideal. They can't get squatter's rights because they haven't been here long enough. I'm going to be telling her mother everything she's done because I'm pretty sure she has no idea. I'm also telling all our mutual friends. I've done a lot of self-reflection lately before writing this post and came to several conclusions. I know she's not my friend. I had a false idea that I was helping someone that I saw as a friend. And in the end, I enabled her shitty behavior. I'm aware I'm a doormat. I know I don't know how to set boundaries. I spent a lot of time on the phone and in professional offices over the last few days. I'm on a waiting list to see a therapist and learn to set boundaries because I don't ever want to teach my kids my bad behaviors and habits that got me into this mess. And for all of you who mentioned that it a miracle my husband is still with me, he was with me along the whole process. I never did anything without his consent since we own the house 50-50. I'm taking most of the blame because Carly was my friend. I've apologized to him and we had a deep conversation about working on communication. He apologized for not seeing sooner that my friend wasn't who she claimed to be and didn't warn me I was being manipulated.